Stephen, thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope you can hear me properly because me and my Amy and technologies are not exactly, you know, they're like your best friends. So I guess if no one is complaining, I think it is working. Please, 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 before we start, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A because the, the, what I'm planning on doing is I'm trying to keep my talking as short as possible. Everyone is experiencing like a Zoom fatigue these days. So I don't want to uh, bombard you with just another webinar. I, what I would rather do is to share with you in the first, as I said, 20 to 25 minutes, what I like I think is the development of AI and uh, how, you know, like uh, where, where things are actually going, in my opinion. And then like, uh, you know, for, like, for the, you know, like for the second half, you know, 20 minutes or so, you know, I will be answering, you know, I'll be able to answer questions that you may have. The questions can be coming in the form of, you know, like you're saying, Laura, you know, thank you very much for like uh, posing the question already. AI in renewable energy and how we can actually create this further. Now, uh, this is a consulting question, but nevertheless, I will try to give you some hints you know, as to where things are going. So feel free, you know, like uh, ask questions. If I can answer them, I will try, like, uh, you know, if I can, you know, I will try to answer them. Right. So without further ado, um, my name is Terence T and I am a, I've been a professor teacher at Hout for the last, I think almost 10 years now, come to think of it. Yes, it must be like in my 10th year. So I have been working with uh, mostly with the uh, Dubai, London, uh, Shanghai. Uh, there was a point I was doing quite a bit of work in, in San Francisco. Uh, but then things like uh, changed because like uh, I, I rejected my my like uh, my life a little bit. So uh, mostly my, my as I said, my campuses are like a main campus is London. So for those of you who join London or Dubai, I shall there is a good chance that I will be seeing you. Now, you know this thing is not about me. This thing is about you. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to actually dive straight into the what I want to share with you. And that is first of all, what I want to share with you is five developments that i see coming like uh, in the in the field of ai now um just to give you some background uh, my bread and butter teaching is in corporate finance um i i have like uh, pretty much like my life been in finance uh and then consulting and uh so you know like uh, finance, uh corporate finance is what i have been doing but until about three, four years ago, I uh, wrote a book with Mark Esposito, whom you saw in the video, one of the global professors in the video earlier on. And, um, you know, we started to look at what were the mega trends. And one of the things that I discovered, you know, like uh, that came to realization. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a very old man. So I, uh, me and technologies, as I were telling you earlier on, you know, we're not exactly best friends. So I was not really that much into technologies, particularly with consumer tech. You know, I don't need the latest mobile phones. I don't need, you know, like uh, the latest gadgets. But what I did realize way back then was like uh, several years ago was technology would be making a fundamental like uh, you know change to the entire business world and as a result i deep dive i decided to deep dive my research if you like you know practical research i'll tell you why it's practical research and this is what a lot of people like uh, a lot of us you know at how to do you know is the practical side um so i was asking myself i said okay there are two technologies that are really i believe would be uh earth shaking that the two technologies that are really going to change the world one is blockchain the other one is ai all right so i wanted to always look at blockchain because i find blockchain to be something that is a lot more intellectually stimulating but what i did not realize at that point and then only like uh, when i look into it i saw that there were very very little like a few actual applications of blockchains I, I, you know, I, I believe that, you know, in three, like in three seconds, you know, why is because it is way too complicated and the technologies like, uh, you know, the blockchain technologies themselves are not actually have not reached the level of maturity required. So I switched therefore to AI and start writing about AI. And then uh, a friend of mine who happens to be, I think, the first intake of MBA at, uh, at Hout, um, and the three are like, uh, so like ask me and say, hey, listen, listen, you know, I'm actually working in the field of AI, please come and join me. So as a result, I started a, like a co-founder of a company uh, called Nexus Frontier Tech. And uh, we actually 
wrote a book on like uh, you know together on AI. All right, and this is called the AI Republic. So me, Mark is the uh, is a professor at at Hout and uh, long term partner in crime, and then you go is now the CEO of Nexus Frontier Tech. We've got a hundred like about hundred people, so we are like in fact essentially a scale up. We're based in London, but we've got operations in different parts of the world, like uh, you know our clients. Now, again, I'm not here to try to actually sell you like uh, sell you the business. Right? What I want to tell you is that you know like uh, is that um, I want to share with you some of the observations that I have made through the lens of the company. Now, there are basically like I think there is a lot of misunderstanding and confusion as to where it, what AI is and where AI is going. Now, I'm not going to actually explain like what AI is because that you know you can you know we'll leave it in the uh, you know it's like another opportunity. But what I do want to share with you, you know, the very very first thing is this, you know, like uh, in like uh, to, to 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 explain what AI is that. There is simply no intelligence in artificial intelligence. All right, this is what like a, this is the main argument we have got in our book, and the reason is very simple because modern day AI, you know, technologies, right? You know, like uh, or like a machine learning or deep learning that you may have heard of, or even neural network, right? That is based on what it is all about is nothing uh, more than number crunching. It is computation like uh, you know computational science right it is nothing more than algorithm if you think about it algorithm it's mainly execution in this case the modern ai is more about executions with a probability so if you think about it it is nothing you know it is nothing but a more glorified version of statistics right and so the result is that you know it is nothing there's nothing intelligent about it there is, however, you know, like we have to say that, you know, there are certain strengths that, you know, the machines can have. And this is what people like, uh, you know, what people call the Morawet paradox, right? What the Morawet paradox says is there are certain things that humans can do very, very well, but much better than machine. And there are certain things that machines can do much better than us. So, for instance, uh, when it comes to number crunching or statistics, you know, machines can do much better than us, much better. Okay. Whereas humans, there are lots of things that humans can do much better. First, you know, physical stuff. You know, like uh, mostly, uh, you know, I, I one thing I like a uh, one one job that you know, in the absence of a pandemic, you know, one job that I think would never disappear. It's basically the people, the housekeeping in hotels, because these are jobs that are really physical. And second, there are lots of things that humans can actually do, like uh, machines cannot, because we cannot actually describe how, like a. If we cannot describe it and therefore you know we cannot you know have like a get program machines to be able to do that now give you an example a three-year-old child would be able to recognize mama and papa all right you can recognize mama and papa your mama and papa like from afar but if i were to ask you how do you recognize it how 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 is it like what made what what give you the ability to recognize them you, you and I will struggle because like we cannot describe it, we just know. So if we cannot actually describe it, how can we program the machine? And that's the reason, one of the reasons why, you know, like, a, you know, like a, we need to understand that when it comes to putting AI into business, you should like a, only be looking at putting AI into those tasks. Please notice the word, the word here is task, not necessarily even activities. Forget even about the jobs or strategy or activities, it's the task because you need to be able to pick the task that the machines can actually do all right so uh, and that i think is one of the reasons why um we like uh, the actual deployment of ai in business world is actually very very slow because like uh, we actually live in a hype and, and you know me <coughs> excuse me media has a tendency to over like uh, you know overdo things and over oversells the uh, the power of ai when what ai can do is something very very narrow in our book we make it very very clear for any businesses to survive you know to put ai into use the one thing they need to actually look at is you know like have a very very like a narrow mind because the only like you need to be able to define a very very clearly defined task in order for machines to be able to work now 
that in itself, you know, creates a lot of like, uh, you know, limitations. And I'm most pleased to see that, you know, this past, like, uh, I think like, uh, uh, it's the, it, yeah, exactly. It's just this past weekend, there was a, uh, there, the, the issue on like an uh, economist um, in the tech quarterly, it says the limits of artificial intelligence. And we feel exceptionally vindicated like uh, in, in this sense simply because we like uh, you know everything we argue in the back end you know it is not as you know as as much as uh, like uh, you know like uh, what we will see in you know like uh, in the media now there is another reason why um ai is so slow in 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 the like, uh, being adopted right and that is because as you may know, right, like uh, in order to power up, you know, like uh, algorithms or like uh, machine learnings at the very least, what you would need to have is a lot of data, right? That's what like a lot of people believe in, you know, you need, you need data. However, however, you know, uh, most of the data out there is uncaptured. So for instance, uh, um, every, like, uh, even the moment we are sitting here, like you listening to me, we are essentially generating data, right? I, like, but the problem here is this, how is the data being captured? Now, the data may be captured, but in the form of this re very recording, but in order to capture the data that is contained within the recording, when I'm speaking and you are listening, you, someone, person, has to actually sit there and type it in, right? So this is what people call the unstructured data. Now, if you think about it, structured data, most of the time, therefore, would be coming in the form of text before AI, okay? So, two things here, you know, like, uh, you know, like, uh, we get two insights here we can get. One is this, the power of uh, artificial intelligence is not only on the processing, so I'm like, uh, let me actually write here directly, it's not only on the processing. Now, we can actually process, you know, like, uh, you know, text, images right including video and voice we can in like a process all three of these right in like a, the technology is behind again you know like uh, we will save it for another day but just as important here is we can now easily collect you know like uh, data and like uh, it, the thing about it right again you know we've got text images and voice right now this one used to be the easiest one too to, to, to collect and easily, like uh, easily uh, process. So like uh, the bigger problem here is that, you know, these guys, right, you know, in the, like uh, were so much more difficult to, to uh, you know, to, this was so much more difficult to collect as well as processing. And therefore, you know, like a lot of the, you know, 80% of the unstructured data, right? Most of the data that is being uncollected, you know, is pretty much here, okay? So now if you think about it, you know, like a now what is like, a, you know, what is happening is that there is a gradual shift from, you know, like, a, you know, like a, because we can now collect these data and process it, which at a much lower cost, right? We are going to see, um, you know, the reduction of unstructured data and more and more data will be structured. But what I'm trying to say, and that's the second insight was this, you know, this actually slows the development or at least uh, the, the business of AI development down like uh, substantially. Be, like uh, as lots of companies, they think, oh, you know, yeah, we have been collecting data. We've got a lot of data, but then let's think about it. Even if you have got a lot of data, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you can be able to reach a like a, you know to, like a, to reach a business objective that you want to achieve there must be like a, you need to be very very clear what the business objective is what you're trying to achieve with machines and this is one of the, the experience we have got with clients is that you like a, you like a, you need to actually the first thing you need to sit down with them is not to actually detail out the technical requirements what is far more like a, to our surprise what is far more difficult to do is to actually get them to detail out the business requirements. So what exactly do they want, to, do you want to achieve, you know, when it comes to, you know, the, the goal you want to serve? And only after that, we can actually think of, okay, what technology is needed? And therefore think of, hey, what type of data we should be collecting? The fact that you have got a lot of data and try to actually, like I say, oh, you know what, let's have, we have got a lot of data, therefore we must be able to achieve a certain business goal. That is, I think, is a misconception. You know, it's, it's, it has lead a lot of companies down the wrong road, right? So 
that actually draws like a take us to the um, to the second development, and that is this: the fact that lots of companies, right, like uh, lots of people believe that you know, like uh, AI is like uh, very very powerful. It is true when it comes to number crunching, but let us not forget this: what you care about is not not always, you know, like uh, all the time, whether AI has come up with the right predictions, whether it's come up with the right outputs, the value, the true value of any output churned out by machine is how you actually use it, okay? So, you know, it can be coming in the form of insights. It can be coming in the form of like, a, you know, like a new sources of information, right? Therefore, one of the keys and one of the total, like, uh, you know, completely like, uh, you know, like um, uh, confused in like uh, ways of people for people to think is that, oh, machines is going to take away all the jobs of human beings. It is not true. Certainly, if your job, if one job is only con consists of only one task that is fully automatable, probably. But if there is any job that is half, like, uh, you know, it's only half automatable, right? Uh, you are not you have, there is a very very good chance that you will not see machines being able to actually take over the uh, the human task right now take a look at the screen this is a this was a, a study done in mit i think three four years ago now so the, uh, like um it is about using machines ai to read uh, uh, uh um i think cancer x-rays okay like uh, what's the like accuracy of like uh, you know cancers like uh, sorry X-ray uh, uh, machines looking at X-rays you know detecting whether there is this is actually a cancer cell or not machines the accuracy is about ninety two and a half percent right so the, the the error rate is there for seven and a half we like resorting to humans humans the accuracy is about ninety seven and a half percent so the, uh, the 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 error is about two and a half percent. But what is clear is that what if machines and humans are working together, you know, the accuracy is close to like, a, you know, it's almost 100%. In short, what I'm trying to say here is that there are lots of jobs, like lots of things that you would want to actually have humans working with machines. There are certain jobs where like uh, you would have no trouble getting machines to do the work, you know, all by itself. And that's the reasons why, you know, there is like, um, like uh, uh, lately there is these three typologies. Human out of the loop, human over the loop, and human in the loop. So in the case of human out of the loop, you are, this is something basically saying that, listen, this is a task. I'll be only too happy to delegate to machines, right? Now think about it. What are the things you would delegate to machines? So if you just want to get machines, let's say, uh, you know, there are, there are certain things that, you know, you don't need to, um, certain achievements, uh, certain uh, goals that you want to achieve, like a reach, but without, you know, like a, you don't, and you don't really need a highest level of accuracy, mostly because the consequence is very, very small. You would be happy to delegate to the machine. Give you an example. You know, every time when you're typing on the phone, right, um, you will be given three suggestions, right, if, if you have got that function. The one in the middle is pretty much, you know, a, like a, a right guess as to, you know, where, like, uh, you know, what your next word, next character is. Or if you go onto Gmail and you type, you know, an, an autocomplete function, right, if like a Gmail would guess, you know, what the rest of the sentence you're trying to write is, right. Now, in this case, let us ask the question, what happened if Gmail or your mobile phone guess wrongly, guess incorrectly? The answer is no consequence at all whatsoever. In this case, I'll be more than happy to delegate these type of tasks to machines because there's no consequence, right? So for the small stuff, for the, uh, for the, for the, for the uh, uh, inconsequential stuff, happily put it in the machine. But if you were like, uh, you know, get, like uh, if you're trying to actually you know, like uh, look at the like, uh, you know, X-ray, in this case, I doubt very much that you would be happy to have a machine doing the diagnostics without human intervention, right? So in this case, you know, we are like a uh, more likely to resort to the so-called like a uh, so-called human in the loop approach. Now, what this is saying is that you know, like uh, you know, the one. The uh, the fear of job losses is completely over, like uh, you know, like overblown. Second, going forward, we tend to see you know machines and humans should be working together, and there is like uh, you know there are more values to be had 
when humans and machines work together. Just to give you an example, um, like uh, at one of our clients with the bank, um, we did actually put machines into, uh, into automating certain tasks, but all the people who were actually doing the task, eventually they all become supervisors of the machines. So you, like uh, we can claim that, you know, like it's possible claim that, you know, we're not firing any people. Maybe we're not hiring as many people as, you know, as before to do the, to do the data entry work, but at the very least, you know, we are not actually like, uh, you know, eliminating the job, like uh, eliminating the staff, okay? Right now, let me actually speed up a little bit. Like, um, so the third development is this. Uh, one of the biggest problem with AI is AI is, can be biased. People tend to think, oh, say, oh, you know what, AI is colorblind. AI, uh, you know, it does not discriminate, all right? Now, as we are all like, uh, here, you know, we are all, you know, we all care about the, the Black Lives Matters like uh, campaign. And, you know, I believe racism is totally and completely wrong. And, you know, we, we need to do that. The problem here is this, what happened, you know, if the data that you put into a machine is biased, the outcome would be biased. Just to give you an example, right? You know, this is like a, a study done. That was like, I think like a three, four years ago. And what you can see is that, you know, the, um, you know, like uh, the, on the fourth picture, you know, the machines identify the man as a woman. Now, here is a question. Why? Why would the machine think, you know, like, uh, why would the machine think the, um, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the man is a woman? Why do you think? Anyone? Why do you think that? You can put it in the chat, you know, just for like, um, anyone? No one want to try it or uh, historically, correct. You know, like uh, Nera, you are right. Because training data consists mostly of women and why? Now think about it, right? It is not like someone is deliberate in doing so. You know, you know it's not like, oh gosh, you know, uh, I want to actually, you know, like uh, get the machines to actually be, you know, like a gender, like a gender bias. No, it's the fact that most kitchens you will have women in like uh, in it and therefore if you are actually thinking oh i've got a lot of data crunching into it so every time the machine what will they will start to look at is that i see a kitchen therefore the person in it must be a machine it's it's exactly like you know like uh, every time when i if i were to say doctor right the first image that came into your head will be a man and the nurse if i say so the first image that comes in you like our head most most of the time will be a woman it is not it's not like we, we we want to bias, right? You know, we want to be biased. It's not. It is. These are what we call it, like a, you know, explicit implicit bias because we just don't know. You know, it's just like self, like a, it, the way we actually grow up because this is the observations we have been making. You know, I think I think the study one of the studies did was like the, you know up to three years like a three years old or like a, you you won't actually be um, having a bias. But starting from three years old, because you have collect probably enough data, you will start to actually become a little bit more biased. So you know, it's it's like a you know that's the thing that you know we need to be able to uh, you know like a really seriously need to look into. That leads to our fourth development, and that is this explainable AI. We need to be able to explain how the AI came up come, came up with the output. Now, one of the biggest problem especially when it comes to the so-called deep learning which is you know in many ways one of the most technical forms of artificial intelligence deep learning what you are so like uh, what happened with ai is you are actually playing with two trade-offs okay there are many trade-offs you're playing with but at the very least you know when it comes to uh you know in the context of being able to explain what an ai do is you know accuracy and explainability so if you have got a simple algorithm right the accuracy will be low but you can explain it quite easily because x plus y you know is equal z but if you were doing deep using deep learning the accuracy will be high but the explain like uh, the way you explain it like uh, you can explain it is very very low and that's because like uh, that's one of the reasons why you know people call ai a black box we don't simply don't know how AI came up with the output. You know what input you're putting in, and you like that because you have to put training data or like the actual data, right? Uh, you know what the output is, 
but you have got no clue, and we have got no clue how the machines actually like uh, figure out what the output is. And without knowing that, you know, we can actually be running into very many problems. Just to give you an idea, right? So if a bank decided to use AI to approve loans, right? Your, your student loan, let's say you're going to take a mortgage. Now, let me, let me put it in a mortgage, right? The machine say, no, rejected your application. And then you ask, so why is it rejected? What happened if the banks tell you, we don't know, but that's what the machine said. What are you going to do? You'll be like having like you have no access to mortgage right so that is not something that we we actually want to see right and going forward right there are lots of situations where we like uh, you know we do need to actually be like um, at least like ai scientists they would actually have to be working on like uh you know like uh, with this and there are different ways already you know counterfactual uh you know like uh, the line like uh you know approach but that is you know, again beyond the scope of this of this uh webinar now earlier on i was mentioning AI scientists, I think one of the most critical elements, you know, that everyone of like uh, everyone, many people in business should understand is this. So lots of companies decided that, you know, they need to a, like a hire AI scientists, right? Which is fine because what they can do is a model, right? They built the models needed to actually drive. Now, here's the thing. The models by themselves are not enough. Why? Because you need the, uh, the IT infrastructure on the side, right? Essentially, like uh, what we always argue is that, you know, this is like a car engine. And this is the rest of the car. If you have got, even though you have got like, a, I don't know, a Ferrari engine or Lamborghini engine without the rest of the Lambo Ferrari or Lamborghini, uh, you know, like uh, infrastructure, right? You won't be able to get a car. You will have a phenomenal car engine, but what can you do with it, right? And that is a big problem because like uh, AI scientists do not really actually do this part. This part needs, what you need to have is like uh, engineers and developers, right? So this is what we call AI ops like uh, AI operations. And I think like uh, there is uh, a very, very critical uh, need for companies to be moving towards like uh, along that dimension. So if for those of you who are interested in, you yeah, like uh, in this, like uh, Mark, uh, Mark and I and, 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 and Danny, we actually wrote uh, like uh, these two articles um, to actually highlight the, the importance of, um, you know, like of AI ops. Just to actually show you what it is, right? The AI ops is this, you know, if you look at the white boxes, those are the models and those are the things that AI scientists would love to do. And these are the only things that AI scientists would probably be interested in doing. The rest, the black, the, uh, the you know, the black box, like uh, the, you know, the, the, all, the, all, the, all the other parts in black, you would need to have, you know, someone to actually build it up. Now, and this actually leads to a problem because a lot of companies, they never, they only think about the white boxes because when you are doing like any companies, when they want to start doing AI, the first thing they would run is a pilot or the so-called uh, uh, proof of concepts, POCs. And POCs are mostly, if not so like uh, exclusively, about whether a model actually works. So POC works very, very well. Now let's try to actually implement it. Boom, this is where everything stops because what is more critical then is to be able to build, you know, the part, you know, the rest in, and then, you know, be able to connect it with the uh, existing IT system. Right, now you may be asking, so Terence, thank you very much for telling me all of this. So how is it going to help me with my life, you know, in the future? And uh, I believe that there are a number of things that, you know, like uh, we can, you know, like, uh, you know, that we like, uh, you should keep in mind, you know, uh, including considering whether like, uh, you know, a, a degree, at, you know, like a program at health. So the first thing I want to actually mention, uh, like all of the five things is one, I think like, uh, this pandemic, right, it's bad, it's tragic, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, but it also opens up new opportunities. And one of the, for sure, one of the opportunities is opening up is a lot of companies are accelerating the digital transformation. Companies are a lot more open to taking on like uh, new technologies. And one of the biggest problem we have been seeing when it comes to people is basically this. 
in order to get like uh, working in business, you need to have someone who can actually speak the same language. If you actually have got scientists, scientists are not like uh, only on this side. They have got no interest in the business side. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest problems we have got when it comes to dealing with, with geeks, you know, like uh, is the fact that we try to convince them that business is like, uh, you know, if there is some value in business because they always think that business in many ways is not scientific, right? You know, like uh, as you can imagine, because it, 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 you know, it, it involves more than, you know, just science, right? Whereas business people, a lot of the time, they don't have the tech, like uh, they don't have the tech background. It's very, very difficult for them to explain, like, uh, or even imagine how technologies can actually be providing values to their activities. So what we need, it's, it's like, like uh, you know, there is a huge gap, you know, like uh, the gap here, it doesn't look that big, you know, visibly, but there is a huge gap right now that we can actually see, you know, like uh, between people, like uh, with people who can speak both languages. And like, uh, you know, I, I actually have a lot more faith in training business people in understanding tech rather than tech people understanding business because the uh, i think it's just a lot more uh, like uh, a lot more flexible from the business people in not to learn about tech don't forget you don't really need to know you know like how to code all you need to know is basically how understand enough how technologies can create value for any activities you are taking on so i think going forward that space that knowledge gap needs to be filled and there is not enough company uh, not enough uh, 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 schools like a uh, training up enough uh, of uh, you know like uh, of, of uh, graduates for that purpose and you know as a matter of fact you know one of the the uh, the, the, the you know like in many many business schools and I work in many business schools is that a lot of them are still very traditional like very very siloed and worse yet they are not very practical one of the things I enjoy most at, like a teaching at home is the fact that they allow us to seriously bring like the practical knowledge into the classrooms and uh and and i i feel grateful because in this way you know we can actually like uh you know get our students to really understand you know like uh, what is really happening out there right so i i think i said like uh you know like uh, like the second point is pick up the fundamental skills and develop the business acumen right fundamental skills the school can provide you uh, developing business acumen, right? You know, it's something I think that uh, that requires like uh, ourselves constantly working, right? Uh, so that one is sharpening our like uh, business thinking. But at the same time, you know, unfortunately, we do have to keep up and learn, like uh, you know, and and learn what are the new latest developments in the technologies. Because after all, if you want to actually be, uh, you know, thriving, yeah, at, at, like on both sides, you need both the tech and the business side. Two other things that I, I, I believe that like uh, it is going to play an extremely important role, right? You know, regardless of whether you're joining a business group or not. One is network, 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 network. Um, I think going forward, we would actually have a lot more of our work done online. But the problem here is going online is much more difficult to do like uh, to do business uh, to do relationship building. All right. So you need to actually try to try to find out new ways, you know, and try to expand your network. Don't forget, um, going forward, I think there is like, uh, you know, because companies, in my humble opinion, many, many companies will try to actually like, uh, uh, you know, cut a lot of jobs and they will decide to actually get a lot more freelance people to do the work right now. For lots of people, being freelance is actually a good thing because it gives them flexibility. The bad thing is, of course, you know, there is pension and there is social welfare, but that's a different story. But I think more and more of us are going for a portfolio career, you know, we do different things. And in order to actually stand out and be able to thrive, you know, in this type of like uh, life, you know, which a friend of mine actually got called a free stack freelancers, yeah, um, having a big network is absolutely critical. Last but not least, right, um, try to have a different views, um, you know, try to actually like uh, get out of your comfort zone, look beyond your own bubble and develop this, what I call the startup of you. You know, every one of us should actually think of ourselves as the startup 
Um, and therefore, you know, we need to be able to continue to learn. We need to continue to develop new like uh, activities. And just as important, like any startup, one of, like uh, is to be able to keep on pivot and keep on changing directions because the world is changing. The same is like uh, for us, you know, what I do hope is that, you know, from, um, you know, having a career, like, sorry, having an education in business school is not just about skill development. It's about being able to develop the necessary acumen, the necessary flexibility in order to act like, uh, you know, to get like that uh, to one, capture the different opportunities that are available and two, you know, be try to actually be one step or if not three steps ahead of anyone else. That's all I want to say. Like, uh, let me. Like, uh, I do apologize for talking way too much. Um, let me actually try to actually answer some of the questions that, like, uh, you may have. Right. So I 